Hey, innovators. This episode is part of a special series for Global Entrepreneurship Week North Texas. Global Entrepreneurship Week is a week-long celebration of entrepreneurship held all around the world this year from November 13th through the 19th. You can participate in an array of hybrid sessions from educational workshops to pitch competitions to networking opportunities and more. Join in on the fun this year by registering at gewntx.co. That's G-E-W-N-T-X dot C-O. This episode of Innovate Fort Worth is powered by PNC Bank. It was June of 2017, and I just started going door to door, like literally cold calling, going to offices and trying to sell advertising for this magazine. And so, you know, I think with anybody who has any sort of aspirations of starting this, I mean, it's not unlike when you were a kid and you had to go and, you know, sell your, you know, school or church fundraiser. It's it, just finding your market, you know, finding your customer and, you know, just, just doing it every single day. Welcome to Innovate Fort Worth, the podcast where we highlight local innovation and the people bringing those innovations to market. I'm Cameron Cushman, and on this episode, we are interviewing someone who has not only built an independent media source for Fort Worth locals, but more importantly, she's built a community. Victoria Wise is the founder of Made Worthy Magazine and Tanglewood Moms. Through her hyper-local magazines and thousands of daily social media users, she shines a light on stories, businesses, events, and the unique culture of Fort Worth. You can find blogs, events, stories, and more on their website. Victoria, welcome to Innovate Fort Worth. Thanks, Cameron. That was a really great intro. I appreciate that. So tell me the origin of Tanglewood Moms. How did this concept begin? And when do you when did you know that you were really onto something that had really kind of taken off? So it began um, September of 2011 as a Facebook group and really just meant to be a place where my then business partner and I could connect with our local friends, um, you know, in and around Tanglewood. When we started the group and we called it Tanglewood, um, immediately friends from all over the city were asking to join. And she and I had a company called Jewelry Nut Auctions. And I thought it would be a good idea to start a local Facebook group. Should we ever need to use it for any marketing purposes for this other business? And it really was never used for that. It took a life of its own as just a place where women could gather online and talk about things happening in Fort Worth or about kids and, you know, all, any it, things that it's still being used for today. Um, and then to answer the second part of that question, in 2015, after we had sold, that was the beginning of 2015, after we had sold that jewelry page, I was helping businesses run their social media. Um, I had a few different clients and I needed some way to show people an example of what I could do if I ran your social media. Because in 2015, it wasn't commonplace to have a social media manager or have somebody on your staff that took care of those things. Um, so I I looked at what we what I had, um, which was this Facebook group, and how could I grow that and grow other channels to show that as an that as an example. So I launched the Facebook page to accompany the group. Um, so there's business pages and then private groups, and so I added the business page. I created a website. I built it myself on WordPress, you know, using a template, and then. Um, I started an Instagram account and an email newsletter. On the website, I began blogging, and it was just my husband and I blogging initially for the first few months, and then I had a business directory listing. So the idea is that local businesses could pay an affordable rate per month to advertise through our social media channels and website. That um, took off. People liked that idea. They wanted to reach this mom audience. And at the time, I only had 2,500 Facebook group, Facebook group members. Um, now we have 28,000. So we've grown a wow. lot. Wow. Um, 
that email newsletter ebbs and flows. People subscribe and unsubscribe, what have you, but there's over 16,000 who receive it. The Instagram account was really, you know, when I, t- when I started managing the social media for other businesses, um, Instagram was still at a place like Facebook was in 2011, where you could grow the audiences quickly. Um, so I just fast and furiously hacked my way to get to 20, well, initially 10,000 um, followers on Instagram and then 20. After Tankwood Moms proved to be a place that um, businesses wanted to sponsor and grow their businesses through our channels, I stopped doing that social media um, marketing job that I created for myself and just focused on, on Tankwood Moms. That's so cool. And so, so take me back to that beginning. Cause you know, it's hard to imagine now a world where we didn't have social media or a world where social media wasn't just so dominant in our daily lives. Um, so take me back to some of those early days. You were one of the power users of Facebook and, and I know you got invited to engage with other Facebook content creators really early in the process. I think you went out to Silicon Valley. Um, what was that experience like? And, and how do you think that's kind of changed your engagement on the platform over time? So the first time we were invited was when I had jewelry nut auctions and my business partner and I, and it was a total of 12 businesses were invited to be a part of the inaugural um, SMB council. So small to medium business to help Facebook executives develop tools to help other businesses. You know, they would, they would create tools that, that would grow their, um, you know, offerings to small business like me. And so what we had done, and one of the things that one of the um, Facebook employees said to me is like, you know, we have a hacking culture here. And what you've done is hacked Facebook because we were selling via comment selling on their, on their platform, which it wasn't designed for transactional, you know, know, experiences, their Facebook pages weren't. And we built software that helped us um, transact and, and get people's information and then be able to ship product to them. So Facebook wanted to know how we did it and what we did and all of those things. And so uh, so they could help other businesses like ours do that as well. So we became alpha and beta testers, initially alpha testers of transactional tools and, um, you know, all of those that they were working with uh, Shopify at the time to be able to have, a, you know, a cart. And then now all of that is also handled internally. So you can choose to connect to these other um, providers for transactional and, and inventory and whatnot, or you can just use Facebook to do like a Facebook shop, if you will, or Instagram shops. So we were just early on in that. It was really cool because we got to meet um, Cheryl Sandberg, the first visit and, um, you know, very, executives and stayed in contact with them. They ran the Facebook SMB council for five years, and then they transitioned into a a larger group of businesses that, um, you know, I was invited to be a part of another group that they created, which was for um, Facebook group admins. And so at this point, you know, so many years later, they wanted to know what was working for Facebook communities. And so on that visit, oh, actually, it was like, I think it was our, uh, after the five years of different SMB council members, the fifth year, we were all invited back for a reunion. And that's when we got to meet Mark Zuckerberg. So that was like, it was cool. You know, you get to see these people that that created these things that have made my life easier and certainly created um a business for me, you know, and, and it's not, not that I'm doing anything revolutionary. I'm just using tools that um, people are already using to help my business grow. Very cool. So pretty humble beginnings with just a, a social media platform and a, and a group, but yeah. you grew it into uh, a print magazine and I'm, I'm holding it up here. So this is Madeworthy magazine. It's delivered all over Fort Worth. And, and maybe you can tell us more about that. But what I love about it is it, it's printed on like newsprint material, but it functions like a magazine. And so it's, it's a little bit of a little bit of a newspaper, a little bit of a magazine. Uh, and it goes out to, I mean, I mean, I'm assuming tens of thousands of Fort Worthians all across the region. Um, mm-hmm. Tell us how you made that decision uh, to go from an online social media presence to a printed copy that showed up in people's mailboxes. Sure. Um, So one thing I've known after selling Jewelry Nut and and seeing kind of the writing on the wall with Facebook pages and and transacting on the side is that, you know, Facebook's reach 
had this huge decline and you were really having to invest more to be seen by the same people. And even though we were collecting email addresses, it just wasn't the same, the level of business that we were doing. I think one day we had a $40,000 day because it was a product that everybody wanted um, and everybody could, everybody was able to see it because Facebook was still showing our pro our page to our followers. Well, that you know, algorithm change, if you will, really um, screwed with it. <laughs> we weren't having those big $40,000 days. We're still doing really well, but um, it, uh, it, 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 I always knew in the back of my mind, I was going to have to fully own a part of my business. Like I don't, can't just rely on Facebook or Instagram or, you know, even MailChimp or email, you know, if people are transitioned to WhatsApp, you know, the rest of the world doesn't use email like we do. So having a print magazine is something that I can fully control. Um, as long as the postal service doesn't just change their dra pricing drastically, you know, that it's, it, I can, I know what my costs are. I know what I can sell advertising for. I know that, you know, there's a place in the market for the type of publishing that we do. Um, we're reaching a family audience in Fort Worth. And that's just something, you know, ever since I went to TCU that is strong about Fort Worth. It's just has these multi-generational families. People stay in Fort Worth and it's just growing by leaps and bounds. And um, yeah, you know, family is just a big part of our, our culture. So um, yeah, that's, that was the impetus for starting Madeworthy Magazine. And I think it gave us just a little bit more clout too, a little bit, you know, that it's, we're putting this on paper. Um, it's not just a blog post that some people think that that's you know going to disappear. Although every single blog post we've ever published is still on our website. That's great. Well, and I'd be curious to get your comments on this because it seems like when you read about big media, right? So your newspapers, your sort of old school media, you know, they're all going out of business. They're really struggling because Facebook took up all their ads. But then you see this emergence of these really hyper local, pretty successful publications, and just like Madeworthy. What what do you think is driving that, and how have you guys been able to kind of ride that wave of uh, more focus on really really local content, family driven content, neighborhood driven content? Sure, you know Michael Sherrod, and I know you know who he is. Um, at He's TCU. been on the show before. He's fantastic. Oh, yes, he he could probably be a regular guest for you. He was the one who before I had the guts to really just push forward to going into print from digital to print, because yes, you hear, and I had seen local publications go under um, thinking, you know, why do I think I can do this? And is this a dumb idea? And he immediately gave me the green light was like, go for it. He said that my first business that I had was in publishing. I think there'll always be a place for local um, stories and I think was it where was he at AOL? What was the company he was with? Or initially, I can't. Yeah, remember. they sold it to it was, AOL. Yes. Okay, so I mean, the product that he had also that he had been working on was stuff for a local um, serving local markets within this bigger you know conglomeration, if you will. So that's what I did. You know, I kind of had. Uh, the you know his confidence and that helped me build my confidence in doing this. Um, you know I don't I don't know I think the trick is just really caring about what you do and I that probably translates to any business or any type of business that you're in. You know it shows when um, the founder owner you know restaurant you know front of house like if you're there and you care about what you're putting out and showing to the world it's gonna it's going to make a difference in the product that you put out and um i think that you know we every single issue that comes out we've we've meticulously gone through every word and made sure everything's correct we're, that we're highlighting as we plan new issues that we're highlighting people that are doing really cool things in fort worth so yeah i think that um our advertisers in the publication have uh, read or read it. They like it. And then because we have this digital channel, it's feeding and helping grow the print side as well. It sort of just comes around and both sides help each other. That's great. Really, really cool. And you kind of touched on this already, but how do you think that Madeworthy and Tanglewood Moms are contributing to the local culture in Fort Worth? I mean, you're obviously uh, going to a creative audience, to a family audience, to a kind of an event-driven people who want to go do cool stuff audience. But how do you think it's contributed to the culture in our city? Oh, goodness. Um, so one of the things before I started the magazine um, was 
I didn't, there wasn't anything really serving people like me. There were aspirational, like high end, glossy, beautiful magazines out there. It wasn't speaking to me. I wasn't building a multi million dollar house. I didn't need, you know, I don't know, super expensive things. I thought it was beautiful and I love to look at it, but it, this just some of the things weren't resonating with me. So, what I think that we've done, and I think that maybe I don't know if we're serve or like participating in that culture, but we're certainly highlighting that culture in Fort Worth. Um, people with great ideas, people who are starting things, um, people that have been around forever that you may have not even heard about. And we, in, in particular, it's something that I really like to do is there are, you know, my husband was born and raised in Fort Worth, um, but there are plenty of new people in Fort Worth and they don't know all of these things. Um, Cause like, you know, in certain circles, it's like, oh, you're, you know, where are you from? <laughs> or, um, oh, you didn't go to TCU. And so, yes, there's an element of that, but there's just so much of people moving to Fort Worth and they need to know about what's, you know, where are these tried into two places, you know, establishments that have been around for decades. And um, who are these new up and comers, you know, that are just like have a dream to start something and, and our newest issue that you, um, held up is our November, December foodie and holiday issue. And we had food trucks and there's a, a story there about a gentleman who he worked in marketing and then he had an idea to do a food truck. And then pretty soon he'll be opening his first brick and mortar restaurant. So anyway, I'm not going to tell the whole story. Hopefully someone will pick up the magazine and see what I'm talking about. But um, yeah, I just, I, I think that's great. I think it, to, it's, it's the heart of an entrepreneur and and that's what I try to uh, convey throughout this magazine. And hopefully it does help with, you know, the fabric of the culture in Fort Worth. Love it. Well, I, I do want to encourage our listeners to go pick up the latest issue uh, and read that story, but you really do focus on small business owners, creatives, entrepreneurs, innovators, uh, and you tell their stories, like, just like we try to do on this podcast. But could you give us a, a few examples of maybe how some local startup companies or small businesses have really benefited from the platform that you've created? Uh, and what has some of those outcomes been over time? So, you know, we have the um, sponsors on our website, and some of them have been around since we launched. I mean, they've stuck stuck around for years and years, and I think it's fantastic. And I think it's because it's worked for them. Um, they are able, as we grow this audience on our Facebook group, they're able to be seen in front of more, you know, more eyes see it and learn about it. Uh, so a person comes to mind, uh, Leslie Shields, and she offered insurance. Well, now she has her own insurance agency and, um, employees, and she's expanded her offerings for property and casualty. And so it, I just, I love to see this, you know, our little Tangle and Moms group help businesses go from one step to the next, to the next. And I, you know, I think that, uh, you know, some people may just need Tangle and Moms because they're having an event on this date, for example, for a stock show and rodeo. I mean, it's once a year. They've been long time advertisers with us. They don't need to advertise all year round, but they know if they want to reach moms with kids and families that they can come to us. And those are the people that are going to see, um, hey, tickets are on sale now. Hey, tonight is um, first responders night or veterans night or um, TCU night, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I just, I, I, I love that we can be the place that small business or as large as area hospitals and museums can come to us to, to serve this audience. So where do you see the future of Made Worthy and Tanglewood Moms, particularly in a world where, world where print is disappearing? Social media is changing just as rapidly as it came on the scene. Where do you see the future of this in, say, five years, maybe 10 years down the line? I didn't know that it could grow to the level that it has. Uh, each year we've been able to grow. I, we've doubled business since 2020, which we did have it have a dip in 2020 that year because people had to, you know, couldn't work, couldn't go to the office, couldn't open their offices. And so we lost advertising there. But since then we were able to double our revenue, um, which is I'm just like, wow, can I do that again in three years, five years? You know, what's possible? Um, so hopefully I'll still be doing it um, at least in five years, maybe in 10. I, I have a son that would 
do anything to go to TCU. So if he wants to go to business school there and take over the family business one day, I would be thrilled as can be. Um, then as far as, you know, future plans, uh, I have tried to expand in a couple other markets. I'm still in the works with that. I have somebody um, who's actually one of my husband's friends in Charleston, which would be a great city to have something like Madeworthy there. Uh, so we're still, you know, working on that. And hopefully I'll be able, maybe I'll go out there and just kind of show them how I did it. Because when I launched this magazine, so I'd been in business in, 20, in 2015 with the digital side, and then it was June of 2017. And I just started going door to door, like literally cold calling, going to offices and trying to sell advertising for this magazine. Um, and then our first issue was September, which means really we went to press in August. So it was just a couple of months turnaround. And so, you know, I think with anybody who has any sort of aspirations of starting this, I mean, it's it's nothing, it's it's not unlike when you were a kid and you had to go and, you know, sell your, you know, school or church fundraiser. It's it just finding your market, you know, finding your customer and, you know, just, just doing it every single day. So Victoria, you've obviously built a really unique business, um, but I know there's been some challenges along the way. There's been some struggles. Can you kind of share a little bit about some of the challenges that that Tango of Moms and Maidworthy has faced along the way, and, and how did you overcome those? So this is the part of a business that you know you 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 really try to please a lot of people, but you just can't. And you have to know those limitations. You can't be everything to everybody. And there's only so many hours in the day. And like, really, you have to protect your own sanity as a business owner. But um, the thing about managing social media and managing 20,000, no, I'm sorry, 28,000, we're probably going to hit 30,000 women by the end of the year um, is really, you know, something I've just really driven, I've tried to instill with this group is that this is not where you go and air your grievances. This is not where you're going to campaign any hard political beliefs. You can do that anywhere else on the internet. You can do it on your personal page. You can go find the people who are, you know, spouting this, that, and the other, and you may love it or you may hate it, but you can certainly voice your opinions there. Tangle and Moms really was meant to be a neighborly, um, you know, I think our, my, one of my taglines is, is the spirit of a neighborhood for all of Fort Worth. And so it's it's really where you are going to help somebody else, not just take, not just, I need this. Can you, you know, not even just the business is advertising. It, it is, how can I help this person? And there's so many helpful people in this group that comment with their suggestions and their personal experiences. And it, Throughout the gosh, however, you know, over a decade of, of of managing this group, is yeah, there have been things that have gone sideways, and there's a lot of funny stories in there too, where people can recount it. I think people have been saying like there should there should be a, a Tangle and Mom's book with the drama that's happened, and so yes, we're just you know try to keep that to a minimum because I really do want it to be a play a positive place, <clears throat> and that's where I feel like when we do something or when I have to go in and put some sort of admin mes message in there that people say, thank you so much, you know, for this, that this is really a great resource and, you know, thank you for your hard work, blah, blah, blah. So, um, yeah. So I guess like the hiccups have just been, um, knowing when to step in, when to back off, when to lead, when to let other, other people lead. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's yeah. Get a bunch my... of moms in one place. I bet there's been some serious <laughs> drama over the years. No doubt about it. Well, I think it's just people in general. Things yeah, will get right. people. People will get uh, riled up at something that they're really passionate about, and I can appreciate that. But at the same time, it's like you're, you know, you're still going to live with these people tomorrow. And it, it is a digital thing, but we're we don't allow aliases in the group. You know, we just we want it to be real people. And you'll see some of the kind of star members comment and help or share information. And so people know these other members that you're not, um, anonymous. So, yeah. Love it. So your platforms have kind of become a source of local events that maybe didn't exist before. Has that been your experience and how do you think you've kind of filled that gap to connect people to all the different things that are going on in Fort Worth right now and new stuff that's coming online all the time, just because we're growing so quickly as a city? Yeah. Well, so 
mentioned that we started the email newsletter um, and we initially had it one time a week and then pretty quickly we switched it to two a week. And so Tuesdays, it is an email uh, roundup of all the blogs that we've published for the week and our, you know, advertisers, banners, and some other information, some little fun stuff included. Then on Thursday, the email is, is events-based. So we're letting you know everything that's coming up for that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, occasionally something that's in the future, but usually just that upcoming weekend. So I think people subscribe to our email newsletter just for that. You know, we're curating the events. Yes, you can go on Facebook, Eventbrite, um, Google, and just search for events. It takes me hours to, <laughs> to put the event schedule for a made worthy. I, I do that one myself. And then my um, editor does it for the email newsletter. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, we're, you're, you're subscribing because you're getting a service and that service is us weeding through the events that we think that you're going to want to attend or not miss. That's really cool. Yeah. What a, what a great service to the community. So I think probably one of the biggest things and really the early key to your success was building community, right? You built a community of moms initially in a very small neighborhood that turned into a big thing. You, you clearly uh, tapped into something that was needed across a bunch of different neighborhoods and a bunch of different mom groups across the, across the community. What advice do you have for listeners right now who want to build their own communities about whatever it is that they're interested in or whatever it is that they're working on? So I think I started at a time when Facebook groups were really early on. And because Facebook, I'm guessing, algorithm is that if something's popular, then they show it to more people and it becomes more popular. So I'm already on that sort of, you know, Facebook blessing. Like I'm getting the love from what's coming in. So starting from scratch is difficult, um, but it can be done. And it just depends on, you know, what you're doing. I think there are creators that, um, and let's say like artists or people that have something to offer and having a Facebook group slash community for people to learn or engage or help each other, um, is worth growing that community can be easier or, or you could have some more success with it. So for instance, I started watercolor just as a pastime, you know, last summer. And then this year I decided I wanted to do pastel painting. And I was on Instagram, you know, searching pastel artists and I saw one that I liked. I, you know, started you know, following her, liking her posts. Well, then I started getting her ads and it was to join her community. Right. Um, and she had done her just a really great She's, I don't, I don't know what software she's using, but she's leveraging existing technology to start her business. Um, so that I think in her Facebook group, there's 90 of us now. And I'll just tell you, we're paying $89 a month to learn how to pastel paint. And we have online meetups. We have critiques in this Facebook group. We have, I think there, it's a upcoming, um, like, live meetup day. So you, you miss it. A lot of things are recorded and it's in your portal and you can review it and rewatch it and whatnot. But this is one that's a, it's an in-person live day. So I think people like her figured out that, yeah, she can use groups to be an extra benefit and, and connect people like, you know, people with similar interests or like-minded people to, to grow her business and yeah, the community. Very cool. Thanks for painting that picture for us. Sure. Uh, Victoria, uh, the question we always ask on this show, I want to know who your favorite innovator is in Fort Worth. Oh, goodness. So um, I do follow a lot of accounts and there's just somebody who's just so cool. You're just like, gosh, they just have their, they have their own style. You can tell as soon as the camera goes on or before you even know who's behind it, um, because it's usually just like a little... Um, Demi toss of a coffee, and then you see Jonathan Morris, you know, taking his morning coffee drink, and I don't—I mean, just something about just how easy and um, smooth he makes his content. I know that he's a, has started multiple businesses, and he's not selling them to you, right? You're just getting a sneak peek into his life. And you can see that, you know, music is important to him. Close friends are important to him. Fort Worth is important to him. And he's doing the same thing we're doing. He's spotlighting um, entrepreneurs with his television show. Um, so, yeah, I just think he cares about what he does. And it, it, it's just cool to watch him. 
Very cool. Yeah, we're, we're big Jonathan Morris fans uh, on the show here. I've had him on as a guest. Nice. And uh, believe it or not, I'm heading to Hotel Dryce right after this uh, to go oh. meet somebody for a drink. So there you go. It's like you read my mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Victoria, thank you so much for joining me today on Innovate Fort Worth. If you want to learn more about Made Worthy and Tanglewood Moms, you can visit their website at tanglewoodmoms.com. That's T-A-N-G-L-E-W-O-O-D moms.com. If you like learning about innovation in Fort Worth, please subscribe to Innovate Fort Worth and be sure to leave us a review. If you want to join the conversation, please follow us on social media at HSC Next. Today's episode was produced by Kendall Rogers. Our digital editor is Jamie Barnhart. Our technical producer is Rob Upchurch from Rob Makes Pods Productions. Innovate Fort Worth is brought to you by HSC Next, a department of the University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth, where we are driven to improve the human condition through a passion for innovation and teamwork. Thank you to PNC Bank for supporting innovation and entrepreneurship in Fort Worth.